Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the workshop on best practices for water use evaluations of commercial facilities. My name is Julie Ortiz. I'm the Water Conservation Manager with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. I'm going to be moderating today's session. I just have a couple logistical things to go over. Uh, first off, I want to make sure everybody knows about lunch. You can still pick up your lunch. Um, the location is noted in your handout. Um, you are here, in case you aren't sure where you're at, you are here at the 15th Annual Water Conservation Showcase. Um, we have a number of co-organizers for this, uh, the U.S. Green Building Council, East Bay Municipal Utility District, uh, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, American Institute of Architects, uh, PG&E, of course, we're here at PG&E's Ener Energy Center, and um, also want to give a shout out to our sponsors. They're noted on the big poster board there, and there are 41 exhibitors, so please, um, they'll be exhibiting till. Uh, six o'clock so please make sure to swing around and see them and uh, show them your premium passport get a sticker um, for those of you who fill in your passport and turn it in at the registration we'll have a chance of winning some really cool raffle prizes that we'll be giving out at 5:30. that's when we do the raffle drawing um, we are going paperless here so there will be no paper handouts of any of the present presentation materials, but you can access the slides and video recordings of all the presentations today. Um, they'll be posted after the showcase on the showcase website, and that website URL is in your uh, handout. The, um, also, uh, you'll get an email, a SurveyMonkey evaluation later on. Do encourage all of you to fill that out because that helps give us good feedback to make adjustments for future year showcases. Um, for any of you who are uh, on social media, feel free to tag us and retweet and post things on sessions that you like. And if you are here for uh, continuing education credit, um, make sure that you note the course number, um, the particular course number for a U.S. Green Building Council is universal to the showcase, but for the uh, uh, AIA, it's specific by session. So um, the information is right there if you need that. And if you need it again at the end, just let me know. Um, do ask that everybody silence their cell phones. Uh, this is an hour session. If we have lots of questions, we can go a few minutes longer than that. Uh, but I am going to ask folks to hold their questions until after our three speakers give their overview. Um, and uh, I'm going to do a little introduction of the speakers uh, all together before they start. Um, we have, uh, I look for your bios here. Um, our first speaker is Michelle Madaus uh, with Madaus Water Management. She is a registered civil engineer in California with 19 years of experience on a wide variety um, in the, of the water resources field. She's been comfortable designing both indoor and outdoor conservation programs with current technology. She has conducted over 300 CII audits and has directly witnessed equipment and program needs of water customers, um, including many in California. So she has some great information to share. Uh, next up is Amin Del Laga with the PG&E's Food Service Technology Center. He's a senior engineer there um, and operates the Food Service Technology Center, which is an unbiased research facility operated by um, and focusing specifically on commercial food service applications. He's been at the center for 10 years. Um, most of his time is on water and energy efficiency projects, hot water systems, dish room field research, and technical outreach. And then our third speaker is Mark Gentili with the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. He's worked there um, in water conservation for the past 19 years. He's currently the manager of all the water conservation programs, and this includes programs for commercial, industrial, institutional, multifamily, single-family customers. Um, he's got tremendous expertise in the commercial sector and is the recycling systems and cooling tower, particularly in recycling systems and cooling tower water treatment. So. Um, with that, um, 
Uh, I introduced the speakers. We'll be um, uh, talking first about plumbing fixtures by Michelle. Uh, Amin will talk about kitchens, and then Mark will uh, round it out with cooling towers. So I'll turn it over to Michelle. Great, and good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, since we have three speakers, we're going to cover um, a lot of material really quickly, but there will be time for questions at the end. Uh, so basically, I wanted to start off with the general. Uh, the best management practices, um, clearly, for faucets and showers and leaks and toilets is to do um, water sense. Um, most of us know that by now, but I am highlighting one thing coming up, and that is water sense um, recommends 2.0 gallon per minute shower heads, and our new California code um, requires 1.8 gallons per minute as of July 1st. So that's just kind of a heads up and I'm going to mention again in a minute and be a little more specific about that. But that's something um, to highlight. Um, and last but not least, I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, water conservation policies. We've done a really good job, I think, about doing water pond requests at restaurants, but one layer deeper that we might want to consider is actually in um, a lot of commercial settings, we do cleaning. It could be cleaning of a restaurant, cleaning of a kitchen, cleaning of a hotel room, anything like that actually uses quite a bit of water. So one thing to think about is what are those cleaning practices? And there hasn't been a lot of kind of universal discussion about that or, you know, kind of um, tips and tricks. So that's one thing to look at is um, if you work with a commercial facility to look at their housekeeping and how they're doing that process. Um, checking faucet showers and tub diverters. Um, measure the flow rates with a stopwatch and bucket. So it's back to the old school. Um, it's the easiest, fastest way to figure out how am I actually doing. So we don't rely on what it's actually labeled. We rely on what it's actually doing because it's going to be um, pressure dependent and it's also going to be dependent on how long it's been used and it's got some rubber parts inside, how is it actually functioning. And my favorite is when people take these aerators and um, this is what an aerator looks like for those of you who don't know. And it looks like there's one there. So you might go, okay, yep, got an aerator moving on. But unfortunately, he's shaking in his head, he knows. <laughs> so what they've done is maybe there was some grid or something in there. They take it out and say, oh, it's plugged. And then they take the guts out of the aerator and then put the shiny thing back on. So it looks like there's an aerator, but there's nothing actually inside. So that's something to watch for. You can tell pretty quickly if you go back to laminar flow, something strange going on. You want it to be, this is a 50% air, which I thought was kind of interesting to show that. Um, and or it could be um, little streams like this if it's actually functioning. And this is more your half a gallon per minute aerator with the 12 little streams. Some of you might have seen that. That's kind of the new regulation for commercial for public spaces. So something to, to watch for. All right, so the new standards. Um, so I put the national standard in the middle, I just starting with faucets, um, and there is distinguishments between residential and commercial. So since we're talking about commercial today, you're going to want to watch that line, but I didn't want to put both on there. Um, a little note about the uh, national standard has actually been a half a gallon per minute for some time. But as you know, that hasn't necessarily been implemented very well because by and large, if you actually go out in the field, they're around 2, 2.2, and things like that. But if you actually read the codes, it's supposed to be a half a gallon per minute. So that's just, just kind of FYI for you on that. Um, and then kitchen faucets are actually not a distinction between residential and commercial. Um, and it's going to the um, 1.8 gallon per minute, but they do allow a temporary override. Those are like the switching valves that you see, and then it can go up to 2.2. Okay, so switching gears um, into our shower heads, faucets, tub spout diverters, toilets, and urinals. Um, one note I mentioned earlier was the change in shower head volume. Now I'm getting a little bit more specific because it's important to pay attention to the details. So as of July 1st is when we make the switch, but manu if the device was manufactured between July 1st and July 1st, 2018, 2016, 2018, they can still sell it in California. So if you go to the shelves on January 2nd, it's actually legal because they're allowing the manufacturers to clear out their inventory before we make the full switch. So that's just an FYI for you. But once that inventory is gone, theoretically, they're supposed to switch over and do that. That exact date, I'm not sure, but it's something to think about. But eventually that stock should go through and then we'll be 1.8 in California. Um, metering faucets, it's a volume. So it's just um, necessarily um, a regulated. Um, it's just a specific volume, not a flow rate. Um, tub spout diverters. There's a lot going on on that right now. Um, there's a lot of research going on um, from EPA as well as um, the state of California. So that's just a watch. And I, you know, I would see what's going on and just 
heads up to watch for that moving forward in the future. There's more devices and more things coming on that. So that's a heads up, it's coming. So um, toilets and urinals, um, pretty similar. But again, I wanted to footnote the difference between uh, the floor mounted and the wall mounted. So again, look at what you have in your facility and then follow the regulations um, according to the device that you do have. Okay, so leaks. Um, they're common, I see them a lot when I go out on the field, um, especially the silent ones. When I get into commercial, a lot of leaks you can hear. I find that more in residential, but when I switch to commercial, it's usually the quiet ones. So um, one way to do that is to actually check with dye. So in residential toilets, you can put the dye tab in. It's not so easy in the commercial if you get flush valves, but you can use a gel and then um, watch for your leaks. The other thing that works when I'm actually working with a facility person is the drip calculator. Because I'll see a leak and they'll say, yeah, I'm not paid to fix that. I don't, you know, it's not worth my time or whatever. But trying to explain that those drips actually add up over time. Um, this is a very basic calculator. You can go in, it's got two lines, drips per minute, and it immediately spits out how many volumes. So it's very visual. It's public. You can link to it on your utilities website, and it's very helpful. So this is a slide I got from um, East Bay Mud. Um, they gave it to me in um, 2015, but I did like it because it's tried to quantify that. Um, if you have a one gallon per minute leak, you're looking at $200. And again, this is 2015 rate, so it'd be even more now. Um, but that's one month. A lot of times people leave leaks more than a month. So um, over time, obviously, that's going to add up. And again, this is just one leak. What if you have multiple in a commercial setting? Then that's going to kind of add up. So. Uh, okay, so checking um, tank type toilets. Um, so we're going to look for the stamp on the porcelain. We're going to check the date. We're going to measure the inside of the tank. I do teach water audits. A lot of times I see people measuring the outside of the tank. The water's on the inside, so we're going to want to measure where the volume is. And a lot of times it will be funky shapes, trapezoids, kind of weird ovals, kind of strange, not trapezoid or oval. So that's a question I get a lot is what do you do with that? Well, use trapezoid equation and you know adjust a little, <laughs> plus or minus. Uh, but you're trying to measure the water displaced at the end of the day and take a look at it you know and see um, if it's appropriate and don't just trust what's written on the toilet actually look inside and try and find out what's actually um, functioning all right checking uh, checking flush valve toilets by and large you're going to see a lot of flush valve toilets in commercial settings but you will see tanks as well you do see tanks when it's um, kind of lower um, frequency type areas, so small cafes, restaurants, um, administrators, back office, that kind of thing. So you will find them in commercial settings. That's why I'm talking about tank toilets if you're curious. Um, so it's a little bit impractical to measure the exact volume. I love, I'm an engineer, I love exact numbers. But in this sense, um, it takes this device over here. It kind of is like similar to a bike if you've ever used a crescent wrench um, and you need a specific device to be able to get that nut off. Well, it's the same idea here. Um, and so you would need that device and you would have to take the top of the valve off and you'd actually have to put a hose in there, connect it, and connect it to a five gallon bucket. That will tell you exactly what volume is doing. I would love to do that. I'm not personally given that kind of time. And I also, a lot of times, I'm not given the liability to go and like dismantle customers' toilets. They wouldn't be too happy with me if I'm doing that. So instead of that, um, we have an estimated formula. I have to be very careful with this. This is an estimate. It's not exact. This is an estimate. It has a lot of assumptions in there. It assumes a specific pressure, a specific layout, and things like that. But it will give you an idea. So don't just rely on the label. Actually flush the toilet and see if it's functioning properly. If you get a three, four, five, six toilet, it's kind of on the lower end. If you get seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, then you've got a higher flow toilet and you want to dig deeper. So that's what it helps you with. But it only takes me somewhere between three and twelve seconds to test a toilet. That's the benefit of it. But take it with a grain of salt. It's approximate. So, yes. Raise your hand if you've got an open seat next to you. Folks, please continue to see. You've got to get people out of the aisle. You've got to get people clear with the orders. Of course. Um, if, it, if you could open seats with your, with your belongings aren't quite in the seat, that would be a great help. Thank else you. I highlight because the laser doesn't show up in the board. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Got it. No problem. Welcome, popular, popular class. <laughs> Glad you're here. Okay, so as I was saying, um, the number one thing that I see um, when I'm in the field is um, diaphragms. They're either they're rubber part, and so everything else on your toilet is pretty much some form of metal or ceramic, and so the rubber parts can wear out 
obviously the URL a lot faster and everything. And theoretically, you should go in and change these out every year. I'm here to tell you most of the time that doesn't happen. So this can wear out, and then you're going to flush your toilet. It's not functioning as labeled, and that's because this part has worn out. It goes up and down and up and down as you flush it. Well, guess what? At some point, it's not closing, it's not sealing properly, and now you've got extra water coming in there. So that's what you want to watch for. Also, famous is storerooms. Storerooms, if you have two different types of toilets, so you have a three and a half and some 1.6s in a mix, storerooms are going to have a bunch of these. And you got to love interchangeable parts. They're good, they're bad. This is the bad of interchangeable parts. The only difference between an efficient one and inefficient is the color, the green color versus the white color. So, But most people just take a part, throw it in, it functions, I'm good, I'm gone. Now you've just converted your toilet from a 1.6 back to a three and a half. I see it a lot. So if you're like, gosh, I can't explain it, and they just replaced the flappers, well, maybe they put the wrong part in. The good news, they're only $35, so it's a quick, easy fix, um, and definitely worth your time um, to look into that. Precedent toilets, I'm not going to talk too much about these. They are out in the field. I don't see them too, too often. Um, they are kind of tricky to test because they are so fast, um, and I obviously can't measure the volume of the water because the volume you know, isn't sitting in there. Um, and the timing thing doesn't really work either. So a lot of times I'll take a look at it, make sure it's functioning okay, and kind of look at the health of the toilet, but I'm not actually gonna get my stopwatch out or anything like that. So um, vacuum assist toilets, again, I'm talking about tank toilets because you will see these. Um, I got this from Niagara because I wanted to be able to explain the technology. I get a lot of questions on how did we go from a seven gallon to a three gallon, it's five gallon to a three and a half to 1.6 to a 1.28 to a 0.8? How are we doing this and how have we gone so far? So we're changing technologies. So they have switched. This is a vacuum um, assist technology, and it allows that lower fill rate. So this will be posted. You're more than welcome to go look at this and kind of see the different technology and how they're able to change um, the lower flow rates, achieve the lower flow rates. Um, urinals. We've got kind of a long way to go on urinals. Um, we have a lot of old ones still in the United States. Um, I have seen a lot of waterless urinals working in the field very well. Um, my caveat is be careful where you put them. So if you have a really, really highly trafficked area, think carefully about that because you're going to burn through your cartridges very quickly and cartridges are expensive. So, you know, I've seen them work very well in low to settings, low to medium, but if you start getting to the high, I might not necessarily recommend that. Um, I would go with the pint instead because then you're not going to burn through um, so much money. Okay, so checking urinals, um, I'm sorry to say there's no official um, quantitative way to test them. That's because there's a different number of holes, number of holes, and also size of holes. And it's a little hard to like, you know, make that all work out um, pressure-wise. So um, I do check the date, date, I check the stamp, and I actually flush it. A lot of people just be like, okay, I'm good, and I'm leaving, but they're not actually checking it. So definitely flush it, see if it's leaking. Don't ignore it. So that's the thing. A lot of times I say you can't test it, then people ignore it. Don't ignore it. Um, definitely flush it and make sure it's functioning properly. Um, so I cannot be here and not say that we are having, you know, some problems in some areas where people are going in and replacing all the devices in an existing facility all at one time, and then all of a sudden they're starting to have issues pop up. What's happening is that the slope of the pipes were designed a certain way. Now we've made everything in the entire bathroom low flow, and then you start getting problems popping up. So my recommendation is if you were doing a large number and you were designed a specific way, replace one or two, try it out, do a pilot first, and make sure it's going to work. New construction, not a problem. They've redesigned things, redone the slopes, and kind of manufactured it such that it will work for the lower flows. But existing flows, some settings totally fine, other settings a little bit more problematic. And the last thing I want to do is have you put in a bunch of toilets in and then have to take them back out again. So um, just try that carefully. Also watch your water quality. If you're going to do treatment on site, there was some great recycling on site systems. Take that into account. Think about your concentrations and what your input volume is going to be if you're going to go um, black water or gray water. Think about that and calculate that in because a lot of the equations I've seen are based on higher flow rates. So just make sure you pay attention. And definitely, if you're working in healthcare, think about that. It changes your wait times. It changes all kinds of things like that. And they're very sensitive about water sitting in pipes. So totally can be done. Just something to importantly think about. OK, so the last um, section I'm going to cover is about the different types of facilities, so office buildings and hospitals. So um, Amin and Mark are going to follow me, and Amin's going to do kitchens, and uh, Mark is going to do cooling towers. So these graphs kind of connect our sections. So I talked about the domestic and the restrooms, and they're going to be talking about the cooling um, on this graph um, over here. 
and the cooling and heating. And then over here, you can again, you can see the restrooms and you can see cooling and heating and you can see kitchens pop in. So again, kitchens probably aren't as big on office buildings because you're not serving as much food. But then in hospitals, obviously we're feeding um, some of the patients so it's much higher. So um, again, think about the facility and where you're located and spend your time accordingly or spend your dollars accordingly. If you're gonna do rebate programs, think about, okay, if I'm working in a hotel motel, this is where the water's going, so this is where my dollar should be going to actually be most effective. So again, guest rooms, kitchens, laundry, and then over here we have schools popped in. I will make a one-liner about kitchens. I am running into a difference there that some kitchens are no longer serving food or they serve food, but they're not actually making the food. They're just getting the food, heating it up, and then passing it through, but they're not really using a lot of water. So that portion is actually changing over time. Some still are and some are not. So something to think about. And they do change. These are approximate. Obviously, it's going to depend on the facility and it's going to depend. But this kind of gives you that concept of it's important to think about before you go into a facility. Um, and then last but not least, restaurants. Huge portion of the kitchen kind of makes sense. Um, and cooling and heating a little less. Laundromats, almost all laundry. And of course, the car washes are the extreme that don't have any of those pie charts I was just talking about. It's mostly processed. So again, um, just a connection. I have some resources here for you later um, to your water sense label products. Again, don't forget 1.8 versus 2.0 on your shower head. So think about how you might want to handle that um, moving forward. And then um, your map testing to make sure you get um, good quality toilets. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amin. Got a really good uh, audience here. Thank you for all coming out on this uh, rainy, uh, rainy day. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, food service. And that's uh, there's a lots of water and energy use. And a lot of the work that we uh, got involved with was uh, initially funded through the, the um, PG&E and other utilities to do the energy side. So we got into hot water. And as we our programs grew, we started to look at uh, cold water applications as well. And so this is kind of a mix of both cold and hot. And we'll cover some uh, some of the easy ones, as well as we'll get into some of the complex pieces as well. So where is hot water used, or where is water used in a kitchen? So we have hand sinks. Uh, there is, it's a small amount of use, but there's lots of hand sinks in a facility. Typically a couple in the restrooms, and uh, anywhere from uh, two to five in the, in the kitchen. And um, we have toilets. Uh, of course, that's an area that um, we covered already. Um, and uh, zipper wells, that's something that has been around uh, since the 70s. Uh, it's used in coffee shops, uh, diners, ice cream shops. Uh, we think um, we can replace all the zipper wells. Uh, we think that's a 20th century technology and we have uh, really great replacement technologies there. So um, testing we've done so far and we'll see is 95% water savings. So we get into that. That's an exciting area for us. And uh, pre-rinse sprayers, they've been around a long time. And uh, we think that there is still a significant potential with um, really gaining those savings. Uh, what we've seen is that if you go too low, um, it's not going to sell. The operator is going to either take it out, replace it with another model, or they're going to bring out the hose. So um, there's a lot of work to do there. and um, I have scrapper on there. Scrapper is kind of what the cafeteria is used. There's a lot of different pre-rinse operations, and we'll cover that as well. So, um, and those larger operations rival the, the usage of the dishwasher. Uh, and the dishwasher is the biggest water and energy user in a lot of kitchens. Uh, so it's it's got a very high water and energy intensity in in the restaurant setting. And we'll definitely cover a few examples there as well as uh, utility sinks, three comp sinks. Um, you know, uh, you have other forms of one comp sinks. They're definitely, uh, depending on the operation, can, can uh, use some water and there's process. So you have a combination ovens, you have your steamers. Uh, they also use a significant amount of water where we've done a lot of work and uh, there's uh, definitely a case for replacement. Finally, ice machines. Uh, you know, that's also one that's relatively straightforward and we'll, we'll cover that. So getting into it, um, 
you know, if you're going to go in there as a water auditor, uh, especially starting out, but I recommend it for all audits, go in there when they're actually operating the facility. So really understand what they're doing, ask a lot of questions, uh, get, it's also a chance to really learn uh, how they're operating it, if it's malfunctioning, there's a lot of things to learn there. So uh, it's a little crazy, especially uh, with those high use applications, but after a little while, you can kind of get comfortable to kind of dodge people and, uh, you know, uh, get out of their way, but you're still kind of really operating and kind of sliding in there. So um, a recent study we just did uh, really looks at uh, the whole restaurant setting. This is a full service restaurant, and this is kind of your typical use, the, where the, and this is a hot water study, so what you're seeing is a hot water, but hot water is about 50% of your total water use a restaurant but it really shows that the dish room is where you really need to put your focus as a water auditor and what it also shows is don't spend too much time at those hand sinks you're looking at anywhere from a gallon of usage per day to maybe maximum 15 gallons there's not a lot of usage per hand sink uh, probably typically around 5 to 10 gallons on average so um, put the focus uh, where it needs to be and you can really drive the, the water use down. Um, and lastly, as you get more and more into it, uh, you'll, you'll start to not rely on rated specifications. They really, as Michelle alluded to, can only tell you part of the story. There are some things like ice machines and your know, cooking appliances where they are tested by third parties and it's pretty reliable, but with anything like the dish machine, or um, certain other, other aspects like your pre-rinse operations, you're not going to know if you just go to, uh, to, to check. You know, That pre-rinse sprayer might be hanging there, doesn't mean they're using it. So, or they might be using other things that are really uh, driving that water use up. So, um, yeah, and of course, you know, hot water leaks are very common. Uh, the on the hot water side, that's where your leaks typically occur. It can happen at the water heater, at the end use appliance, um, and definitely doing your auditing of their historical use is a huge part of uh, um, doing water audits in a facility. So moving on, uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, boilers. Uh, traditional uh, boiler-based uh, systems use lots of water and energy. You're looking at about 32 gallons per hour. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details uh, of how these technologies operate, but boilerless steamers have been around. They're very mature. They work in a lot of applications, except for maybe uh, your, like, um, your seafood place where they're doing a crab and they're popping in something else. Uh, for batch cooking, your cafeterias and a lot of other, uh, like your rice or things of that nature, they work really well. Uh, so I would probably say like 80, 90% of the applications Boilerless steamers will work really well for you. And you're driving the water use down from 30 gallons per day to 3 gallons per day. So 90% save water savings. Of course, there's lots of energy savings associated with that as well. So ice machines, another th one that's really straightforward. We've moved away from a lot of water-cooled machines, but they're still around in uh, hotels or in um, situations where they can be uh, utilized with um, other equipment, kind of have reuse aspects for that water, but ultimately you want to move away from water-cooled machines and also uh, there's a case to be made with the water and energy savings to really push for the, the um, Energy Star or the, the high efficiency machine um, because you'll get the water savings. Uh, we're looking at basically, um, whoops, uh, you're looking at significant water savings around maybe 13,000 gallons per year on an average machine. Um, but there's lots of energy savings. So there's definitely a um, business case to be made to, to go to the best, uh, the best machines out there. Now, with ice machines, they are really well um, tested. There's, there's testing of all machines. It gives you the amount of water and energy use per 100 pounds of ice. So that information is out there. There is a body that produces a list uh, for it. So. Uh, other things that you might not see your first time through, you might want to ask, is how do they thaw their food? Uh, a lot of like um, places when they, they're slammed, they, they really need to, uh, to do this forced thaw, which is to run 
water over your, um, especially your proteins. And so it really adds up. Uh, we're looking at, in this example, uh, 3 GPM for three hours a day. Uh, you're looking at um, conservatively around $3,400. The water rates now in the Bay Area are, uh, are higher than this $13 per 100 cubic feet. So in San Francisco and especially in other areas. Uh, the better solution is to actually do uh, more of a planned thaw. Have the storage space so you can actually thaw the food in a refrigerator or in a walk-in cooler. And uh, the additional storage space, um, you know, there is a return on investment to plan for additional um, uh, space just for thawing. So, um, and I'll move on. Uh, I really want to hit the, the dish room. Uh, the pre-rinse sprayer is, is still an area we can improve on, uh, but ultimately uh, where we really are trying to get an understanding of things now is this pre-rinse operation. Uh, this is, for example, two cafes on a, on a corporate campus. Um, one is using a higher pressure, um, one is using, they're both using high pressure, low flow pre-rinse spray nozzles. They're also operating the scrappers. They're like little waterfalls. They, they allow you to um, keep both your hands on the wares and not to be operating the pre-rinse sprayer. So you can theoretically rack a lot faster uh, your dishes before they go into the dish machine. Uh, but they're continually using uh, fresh water, say at 2 GPM, and then they're using uh, recirculated water, let's say at 8 GPM. So 10 GPM total of just lots of water on the plate to, to, to get the food off of there, kind of put some heat onto the dish before it goes into the dish machine. And um, we looked at two identical kitchens with the same hardware, and we saw wide-ranging um, results in water energy use. Uh, for example, the Masa Cafe had a, um, a 1.15 GPM uh, spray nozzle, and, but they were not using the scrapper. And so uh, ultimately, they were using about 100 gallons per day. And some of the metrics that we use is we actually uh, look at the rinse time of the dish machine. So then, therefore, we can, instead of just looking at gallons per day, we can, um, uh, in a sense, uh, use a metric of gallons per hour of dish machine use. Or, so in, in a sense, this operation, that pre-rinse sprayer, was using 18 gallons per hour of the dish machine rinse operation time. So. Um, that is a rule of thumb that we, we use in our um, testing of dish machines and also pre rinse sprayers. Now, this Heritage Cafe, it, had a, uh, it, had a, um, it didn't have an efficient pre rinse sprayer. It was the old uh, model, 2.5 um, gallons per minute. And what they were doing is they were actually using the scrapper. You can see it on the lower picture right there. Um, but they would just leave it unattended, which we commonly see in cafeterias. And uh, worst thing, um, you guys see that little chemical dispenser? Uh, a lot of times it's cold water that's coming into the scrapper. So to add heat, because their hands are in there, they want to kind of um, work with warm water. It's a natural thing to do. They were actually running the degreaser solution into the scrapper uh, continuously. So the combination of the scrapper use, the pre-rinse use, and this uh, modification they did with uh, the degreaser water, they're using about 3,000 gallons uh, per day, or roughly 840 gallons per hour of the dishwasher rinse operation. So really large number. You know, there are a lot of cafeterias in the Bay Area, um, and a lot of times the workforce is completely separated. Um, it's usually a third party, so they don't pay the water and energy bills. And so there's really, they're just trying to do their job as fast as possible. And that's kind of what, what they're pressured to do. So um, that one really got us like, wow. We should really start looking at these uh, cafeteria-style pre-rinse operations. The scrap collectors, the disposers, those troughs. There's lots of different kinds of uh, uh, larger operations. And there's quite a diversity of kind of what we think it's supposed to use and what it really uses. And so uh, we have been embarking on a study. This is some old data. We're going to add eight new sites to the study. But it shows that um, basically, uh, the operation can be anywhere from 90, 100 gallons a day to upwards of 3,000 gallons a day. And when you're looking at the pegging it to the hours of 
a per hour of rinse operation, there's a huge variety from that um, 18 gallons that we saw earlier to upwards of 800 gallons per hour of rinse operation. So um, lots of opportunities, um, and we think we can kind of understand these technologies a lot better. And when we, can, when we come back, we can kind of rate what's the best uh, technology and what's, what are people going to misuse and what are some, uh, you know, what are the things to get? What we generally see in the dish room is keep it as simple as possible. Therefore, they don't have that many options to kind of misuse it. And so that's kind of our biggest message to, on the design side. So um, moving on, um, the biggest water user is the dish machine. And so there's a lot of different kinds from like an under counter, which is similar to like your home uh, dish machine to, uh, but all these dish machines, they don't uh, wash a rack in an hour's time. They wash a rack in a one or two minute time period. And a lot of that fresh water use is with the, the rinse operation that's maybe 10 to 15 seconds long. So uh, there's a lot of energy and water going through this dish machine that when, it's, uh, when it's slammed, like in a meal period. So uh, the larger machines are conveyor machines. Instead of being a batch, you put one rack in, they have a, a conveyor belt, and you're just feeding it rack after rack. Or with the largest one, the flight type machines, it's, uh, it's more of a, um, a belt where you just put stuff on. You don't have to have racks. So um, there's different sanitation methods. Uh, chemical sanitizing is preferred for your restaurants, but uh, hot water sanitizing at 180 degrees is a higher performance and also lower water use. And so we have done a lot of testing in food service facilities. And um, what we typically see, this is a conveyor machine. Um, and the salmon color is the dish machine water use. And on the left axis is the hot water flow rate. So we're looking at 10 gallons per minute whenever that dish machine is operating. This is a conventional uh, dishwasher. And on the right axis, you see the daily water use, uh, So um, which is the... So, uh, which is the kind of the darker red line. So the dishwasher is up using about 3,500 gallons of hot water per day. Uh, and uh, the overall usage in the facilities is a tad over 4,000 gallons. So this conventional dishwasher is about 75% of the hot water use, which equates to maybe 50% of the overall water use in that facility. So that's why we're really focused on, on that area. There's a huge difference um, on the x axis on the Left axis is the energy use per, per hour of rinse, and then the right axis is the water use per hour of rinse. And as you can see, when you go from conventional machines to energy star machines, you get about a 50% water and energy reduction. And now when you go from energy star to what we are terming best in class, you get another 50% reduction. So there's significant savings when you're working with these larger facilities. And if you're going in there as a water auditor, uh, they can always do better than Energy Star. We see Energy Star as the, um, the as the lower bar for efficiency when it comes to dish machines. So, and uh, that's kind of some of the information that that we have on that. Ah, something new: uh, dipper well replacements. Uh, scoop shower is one of the things my colleague Michael has been working on. Uh, this is at a Jamba Juice. We were looking at the dipper wells that were in there. They had three. And, and they were operating about 13 hours a day. They were using around 165 gallons per well, so you're looking at a usage of about almost 200,000 gallons per year. All this water goes down the drain. It's there to just maintain those utensils for up to a four-hour period, so they don't have to. They can reuse each utensil uh, for their operations, like ice cream scoops, for example. In this application, there's uh, some really great uh, replacement technologies. This one particularly is out of Germany. There are other ones that are based out of the States. But with all the technologies that we have looked at, and for ones that we've just kind of put together, we generally see about a 95% uh, water savings. Um, not all these dipper wells are cold water. And like um, for butter or mashed potatoes and a um, in the dining or full service application, we definitely see hot water dipper wells as well. But one thing that we see is 95% savings, uh, and not each one doesn't work for all applications. They're all application specific, so we think there's a lot more testing we can do to kind of figure out which 
Dipper wallet replacement technologies work for which applications to really help the market so we don't have a situation, for example, with the first generation high efficiency toilets where people weren't happy with them. We want to make sure when we roll out all these Dipper wallet alternatives that they really work for the customer and that we really get that high uh, water savings number that we have in our testing thus far. So there's a couple studies. One's going to be coming out. One's already out there. So um, definitely check them out. So uh, finishing off kind of with aerators. When you go from that 2.2 to 0.5, which is for public laboratory sinks, uh, you're going to have an issue with getting hot water to the hand sink. Uh, in this example, in the graph uh, to the right, um, what you see is you want to get hot water there in 10 seconds. And that's kind of the red line. It kind of shows that. When you go to that 0.5 GPM, when that um, say you're on a recirc loop, when that drop is cool, it's going to take you up to 40 seconds to get hot water. And so not every user, only maybe during the peak of the meal periods, is going to get hot water. So uh, a lot of times those low flow aerators aren't going to work um, unless you have like a point of use electric heater. And we've done a lot of research there as well to, to show that not about 10% of all the point of use electric heaters work at those low flow rates. So um, you got to really uh, uh, plan wisely. Uh, these are some of the assumptions we made. So um, that really wraps up everything in food service. And um, I'm going to turn it over and we're going to be covering the cooling towers. So thank you, I mean. <laughs> And next up is Mark Gentili with Los Angeles uh, Department of uh, Water and Power. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Uh, what do I have? A minute, a minute and a half to do this. Yeah. Can, um, I'll be, I'll be around after yeah. to answer questions individually. So in the minute and a half, I'm going to cover uh, types of cooling towers, um, how cooling towers operate, uh, audits, sizes. Um, the water treatment programs that you use, because that's really the key to water conservation, is the water treatment that you do, and uh, uh, cooling tower controllers and metering. Uh, this is just a disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm not giving you legal advice. So you saw it. Um, okay. So here, <laughs> here are uh, cooling towers, many different sizes, shapes. Um, Function is all the same. Basically, they vaporize water, and by doing that, you cool the water that's not vaporized. Um, so first, I just want to look at a couple of them. So this is a 650-ton induced cooling tower serving an office complex. Uh, induced means that it draws air from the sides. It's got a fan at the top, and it draws air from the sides out the top. The other type is forced draft, and that actually has like squirrel cage type fans that are on the sides, and they push the air up through the top. But either way, air comes out of the top. So obviously, they're measured in, in tons. Uh, this one here is what you'd see in a supermarket 200 ton evaporative condenser. So you see that in the mezzanine of a supermarket, and basically, um, that's cooling refrigerant, whereas a cooling tower is cooling water. That's the difference between an evaporative condenser and a cooling tower. Uh, they come in all sizes. Uh, this one here, five-ton cooling tower for uh, dry cleaners. Um, you'll see those disappear because uh, dry cleaners are moving towards wet cleaning. They don't need to, to cool the, the perk machines that they have, but people still have perk machines. I think they're like, um, what, phase five or something where they're at. Um, and lastly, this one doesn't look so big from here. But this is actually a, a city block in downtown LA, 20,000 ton cooling tower, and it serves uh, 13 criminal courts buildings. Uh, cooling tower basically, cooling tower takes uh, hot water from the, you have a chiller which has an evaporator and a condenser, and it takes the hot water from the condenser and sends it up to the top of the cooling tower, and there are spray balls inside of the cooling tower that spray the water. And then as air is drawn up through it, you get a change of state into a vapor. So some of the water comes out as vapor, some drops to the bottom up to 10, de 10 degrees cooler. Okay, so I'm here to talk about what would you do for a cooling tower audit. And it's really important in a cooling tower audit just to get your, 
your regular information, which you normally get, you know, date of the audit, um, who's your contacts. Um, right here, I just put some, some information in there. None of it's real. Um, facility uh, square footage, very, very important, 750,000 square feet in this particular case. Okay, so here's the actual cooling tower audit part, portion of it. And in a cooling tower audit, um, it's really important to get chiller size. So you get that from the, the facilities director, facilities operator, and what's the size of the chiller. So I'm going to put some numbers in here. Let's say it's 1,000 tons, and it's an office building, so it's operating 12 hours a day, five days a week. And then you usually have at least two chillers. The second one, in this particular case, it's a, they're, they're identical. You'll see that a lot. Um, the second one is actually redundant. So what they do is they switch back and forth from, coin, from, uh, chill, uh, from chiller to chiller to keep them all in good shape. Uh, but maybe five days a year, you know, it's 110 degrees outside, you turn on the second chiller. So that's why you want chiller tonnage because cooling tower tonnage is not really very reliable because a cooling tower has to face the hottest day of the year. So you may have this particular case, 2,000 ton cooling tower serving the two 1,000 ton chillers, but it'd probably be 2,000, 2,200. If you base your savings on that, you're going to be way, way overdue it. I actually had a, a 60,000 square foot building that I looked at at the very beginning when I was learning about cooling towers. And basically, I based their savings on the 400 ton cooling tower that they had. And then later on, unfortunately, we actually put meters on it, and my, my savings were like five times higher than their actual usage. So that's why I should have looked at chillers because they had four. 150 ton chillers, and if I looked at those, I would have got a more accurate savings. Um, the type of water treatment is very important. Um, this particular one is standard water treatment. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then do they have water uh, metered? Is the metered water, is the water metered going in? Is the water metered going out? So one's called the makeup, the other is called the bleed. So bleed or blowdown, a lot of people call it blowdown. Um, so in this particular case, we don't have meters on the makeup or the bleed. So I want to give them meters. At LADWP in our programs, we give the customer meters, and they, they don't hesitate to install them. So if I was going to give them meters, I'd want to see what's the size of the piping. i got a makeup meter, uh, pipe two inches, uh, blowdown one inch. And then the type of co controller, you know, is it wall cam, uh, Canon, Chemtrol? Um, we'll talk more about micromoles in a minute, but I want to get the reading off the controller that's on the side of the cooling tower. And lastly, is there any additional water use that are like waste streams that um, I can use at the facility in the cooling tower? Because that's a big project nowadays you're going to see a lot more of. And this particular one has condensate from the HVAC system, and you can reuse that in the cooling tower. So again, I mentioned it's more important to get the size of the chillers than the size of the cooling tower. Okay, cycles concentration, that's where the water savings are, and it has to do with the water treatment. So basically you have a piece of equipment, the, the uh, conductivity controller it's called, on the, size of, on the side of the cooling tower, and that measures the what's termed the micromoles of the water, or the microsiemens, which are both the same thing. In DWP territory, uh, our water varies from uh, 300 to 1,000 micromoles, and that, that depends on where we're getting our water from, Colorado River, or over here, Sacramento Delta, pristine water, Colorado River, not so pristine. So if you have the uh, makeup water coming in at, let's say, uh, 300 micromoles, and then you measure the water in the cooling tower, or you look at the controller, and let's say it's 900, then that means you're at three cycles of concentration. So you can measure it. You can measure the water yourself. This is a good tool to have when you're out in the field. Um, it's a, called a conductivity tester. And I, this particular one, you can't read it, but it was 363, and that was parts per million. So you have micromoles. Micro semen, same thing, and then you have parts per million, or it's also called total dissolved solids. 
So in this case, if the water in the cooling tower was 108.9, and what I measured in the, the makeup water was 363 divided out, that's three cycles of concentration. So what do cycles of concentration have to do with savings? Um, and what type of water treatment do you do to save water in a cooling tower? So I already mentioned standard treatment. So in LA, that's just adding uh, this chemistry, phosphonate chemistry, and keeping the cycles uh, lower, probably two to three. That's called standard. Uh, we also have customers that lower the pH of the water, and by doing that, you can prevent um, scaling. That's the main thing we're worried about in California is scaling in the cooling tower. And lastly, you can pretreat the water. You can soften it. Um, you can use deionization, uh, whatever you do to remove minerals from the water before it even goes to the cooling tower. Okay, I'll breeze through this. Um, this is just showing somebody starting at two cycles and upping the cycles and what kind of savings that they'll get. If you notice um, the, on the right side, the percentage savings as you go up in cycles, it's, it actually gets less and less between cycles. So you kind of have diminishing returns as you go higher. So most cooling towers, two to three in LA. I'm talking about LA, not here. Um, you have much better water than we have. 4.5 to 8.0 is where you'd be adding an acid and lowering the pH or softening. And then lastly, we have even 10 cycles and higher, which is um, kind of, I'll just call it super, super softening. That's cleaning up the water even more before it goes in the cooling tower. Uh, metering, very important. Worst case scenario is you don't have any meters on the makeup or bleed. Um, so that's why we give them meters. Then I can accurately see what their savings are going to be because I know at one cycle is what they're at. I know if you go to this cycle, there's, I've got a calculation I can do. And you can feel free to email me or call me on the last slide if you want to get those calculations in the spreadsheet that I use to figure out what the savings are. There's the controllers that I mentioned before. These are old uh, non-digital ones, and this is kind of the state-of-the-art. Um, it's got two-way communication. You can see where the cooling tower is at. Just go to a website and, and look it up. That's it. Thank you. So we have time now for questions. Um, I am going to ask folks to raise their hand. I'm going to hand a microphone around because uh, we're this is on webinar and we're recording it, so it's important that you speak into the microphone. So. Hi, this is a question for you. Mark, um, do you know of any projects in your jurisdiction which have combined rainwater harvesting with HVAC condensate to do cooling tower makeup water? So it's funny you should ask that because I just heard about a, a project the other day. Where it's a new construction and they were going to put in um, a basically a recycling system. $650,000 recycling system, new construction, big hotel, I'm not going to say the name of it. They decided not to put in the recycling system. They were going to recycle gray water. They are also going to add storm water and condensate to it. Well, what they're doing now, which they're required by, by LA, is they're taking the storm water. I think it's up to, you have to take a half inch occurrence. They're taking that water, condensate, and water that goes through, there's runoff on the site. And so that would be water that maybe goes through, let's say, potted plants and whatnot, goes through and then runs off. So they're having a terrible time because all they have is UV treatment and the water is constantly fluctuating because you have condensate, which is really corrosive. You have water that's going through the plants, which is basically potable water. And then you have gray water. So by not having that recycling system, they're having a terrible time keeping the cooling tower where it's supposed to be. I don't know if that answers your question. Over here. This question is for me. Have you ever done an audit at the uh, Chinese restaurant where they have like a waterfall keeps going, you know, the water just keeps flowing? How do you, what's your suggestion to them to save water on that kind of scenario? Uh, we've done a little bit of work uh, at 99 Ranch. Uh, 
but we always love to do more work for uh, that entire community. There's a lot of walks out there, and um, as water prices have gone up, uh, they have. Uh, I don't know if this is on. I can fix it. Yeah. Can you all hear that? So as water prices have gone up, uh, they're really paying attention to it more. But can they do more? Yes, they can. Uh, unfortunately, the culture here in America is that uh, we fabricate a lot of those walks um, by hand, very small fabricators. So they're not in a place where they can design a, a waterless walk. Uh, those are available in Asia and Australia. Uh, nobody has really uh, made the effort to bring those out here, get them certified, or develop one. So the market hasn't stepped up. Utilities haven't really stepped up to really incentivize it or trying to work it. So it's kind of like chicken or egg. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Kong over there, uh, he might know of... Uh, yeah, so the paid range uh, is one that does it. Can you repeat Monarchy that? Okay, Jade Range and Montague. Um, so there, there, are, there are potentially are. We haven't tested it. We don't know how effective they are. But uh, would love to. Uh, if somebody would like to fund the project, we'd love to be a part of it. So. Yes, sir. Hi. This question is uh, primarily for the first two speakers. Um, do either of you see any benefit in um, submetering, like permanently installed submetering, for um, your um, the audits that you do, or ju just generally for ongoing uh, monitoring of water usage and leak detection? Um, short answer is yes. <laughs> Submeters are wonderful, um, especially the larger the site, the more useful they can be. Um, I went out to a facility and they had a large leak and we don't have a submeter. It's kind of challenging to find out where it was um, and it wasn't obvious. It wasn't surfacing, you know, so when you have a leak and you don't have a submeter, it's hard to isolate and so you have to check everything, you know, and um, the less obvious it is, the more checking you have to do. So, but even just to regularly monitor it, absolutely. If I would going to monitor and submeter one thing, it would be cooling tower um, because it's the biggest user and you definitely want to make sure it's not leaking or having problems um, and or the whole entire kitchen but that's kind of hard sometimes so but absolutely and a lot of his projects he does he's, he likes to submeter the submeter like he'll have like all little devices on Stanford he submeters just the dishwasher and different elements so Folks, uh, move real close to the microphone when you talk with okay. those so in the food service setting we definitely want to submeter the dish room separately from the actual kitchen. The dishwasher, and especially those larger cafeteria style pre rinse operations, they should have their own meter. I, I believe the voluntary green code in California is anything that uses over a thousand gallons per day should be submetered. And uh, we really like that to actually be an actual regulation. So, um, so uh, by design, uh, we would be installing submeters in these facilities. I think there's a role that both energy and water utilities can play to um, provide those free, uh, free meters, in a sense, like they do in LA, uh, for those types of high usage uh, water using applications. Great. Um, Michelle, so in the public sector, there's a whole public bathrooms not wanting to touch anything feeling, and so I'm always um, trying to ban people from not putting in the automated flush valves because there's studies out there that show that they use more water, right? So mm -hmm. is that, I mean, there are some studies that say they don't, so <laughs> what's your stance on that? Um, on average, they do use more water. Um, it's, it's hard because it is a public health and safety thing, so public health and safety likes them because you're not touching things and, you know, it's not a transfer of germs, so they're publicizing it, and so... Um, water conservation, they all, they, if you go in, they invariably think it's a water conservation device, and they invariably think that, like whether or not it's true, and we've been counter-publishing that you're right. The studies are showing it's the opposite, because they're double flushing all the time. Um, and so conservation, it's not been promoted, but we're getting currently overruled by public health and safety. So it would be nice to get those two merged into the same world, but at this point, that's the challenge that we're facing. So yeah, ideas and suggestions, you know, on merging.
More questions? No more? Well, our speakers well, will be an around. Oh, an announcement. I have an announcement, yeah. Okay. So if you're going to come to the raffle today at 530, um, we're giving away, um, the Dallas Water Management and PG are giving away um, two kits. And in the kits, it has goodies for doing commercial water audits. And it also includes um, a free software. So when I go in the field, I use um, software that can be used in anything that runs Excel, a tablet, or a laptop. It's really helpful to collect the information and auto-generate reports for you. So um, I'll enter my cards in there copy the software. Hope you come at the raffle at 5.30. And if you have any other questions, let us know. And PG&E does training here as part of their regular training series. Um, there's a, a one-day class that's offered free on water audits. So if you want interest in that, talk to Ryan or myself. We can try and get you an email and set up on that class to learn more. So you can get uh, Michelle, Amin, and Mark's slides on the website for the Water Conservation Showcase. I um, encourage you to check those out. Thank you all, and please join me in thanking our speakers.